Hi everybody, my name is Charlie and I'm here to tell you a little bit about some work we did with uh, Gilles and Steve about uh, probabilistic programs of our finite fields and some of their relational properties. So let's get right onto it. What kind of programs are we looking at? So we see basic programs, inputs, random samplings, some operations, conditional branchings, uh, multiplication addition, and at the end you return some values. We don't support loops because in fact uh, if you add them or problems become indecidable, so <laughs> that's that. But for this kind of programs, there are some uh, classical verification questions for such programs. And the most classical one being equivalence between programs. As we are probabilistic, it means equality of the distributions produced by the program. And in fact, we come from the context of security, uh, computer security. And we want to look at other properties that can be of interest for us, independence, uh, because often we want to prove that a program, the distribution of a program is independent from the distribution of some secret value, else it is not secret. And also, we want to be able to bound uh, the probability of some event inside a program, uh, notably when some event is bad for the security, we would like the probability of this event to be low. So, first question, are those problems decidable? When in fact, we have our finite fields, uh, they are finite. You can simply compute the distribution, and that's it. Everything is decidable. But an open question was the exact complexity. And still coming from the world of security, uh, we actually, actually introduced a variation of those questions, which we dubbed universal. Uh, because in fact, when you have a Boolean program, when you have a program that operates over Booleans, you can actually see it as a program that operates over bit strings. And you can choose to use any length of bit strings for your program. You still have uh, XOR and AND over those bit strings. And given such programs, you can actually ask if two programs are equivalent for all possible length of bit strings. And that's a new question that we call universal equivalence. And it's not so clear if it's decidable. Because no, we have an infinite number of cases to check. So that's one of our big questions also. And this, in our paper, we start by showing some first reductions between the problems. So actually, independence, equivalence, and equivalence with all inputs are all three interreducible in polynomial time. So they are the same, essentially. And then we look at the complexity in the finite case of those three problems. So for finite field FQ, uh, we have exact complexity for each of the problems that we want to look at. But secondly, and probably more importantly, uh, our second contribution is that in the universal case, equivalence is decidable. So that's it. Let's look at uh, the formal definitions before seeing a little bit of the complexity and how we prove the decidability of universal equivalence. Uh, I won't delve into details about finite fields. Essentially, you just need to know that uh, you have uh, usually a base finite field, which is a set of integers of size uh, p for some prime p. And then you can consider extensions of this finite field uh, for each p to the power of some k. That's all you need to know. Uh, based on this, we look at programs. And in fact, we can uh, see the base expressions of our program first as uh, polynomials, uh, where we distinguish the set of, of variables of the polynomial into two sets. i is for the inputs, and r for the random samplings. Then we add conditionals over such uh, polynomials. And in the end, the program is essentially a tuple returning n expressions depending on the conditional branchings. So let's take a look at two very simple programs. Uh, this one is simply returning three values, taking as input two possible values x and y, and sampling uniformly some u. Uh, this one sample, sample uniformly three values and return a single one by computing this big operation. That's it. So to give the semantics of our programs, we need to define the probability distribution that they follow, in fact. So for program p and some sequence of input inside f q to the power of k, we can define uh, the distribution of the program uh, such that for each possible value c 
that the program may take as output, we, we associate to it the probability that P evaluated given I, the value given as input to the distribution, and some R, some value R for the random variables, the probability that P is equal to C, when we sample uniformly R inside F Q to the power of K. And that's it. So using those uh, distributions, we can start to reason about uh, problems. Uh, over FQ, so that's why we have this Q here, uh, R, the, the small program that returns R, will simply, be, will simply be equal to zero with probability one half, and to one with probability one half. Uh, I times R, when I is equal to one, uh, it's simply equal to, oops, sorry, it's simply equal to R, so we have the same distribution prob probability, but when I is equal to zero, I times R is in fact uh, uh, always equal to zero, so the probability is that uh, the distribution is such that the probability that it's equal to zero is equal to one, and the probability that it's equal to one is equal to zero. Uh, so equivalence for some q to the power of k simply acts that for all possible inputs of the program, the two programs produces the same distribution, exactly. And universal equivalence, we ask that for all possible k, for all possible power k, p is equivalent to q when we are looking at f q to the power of k. So now that we have those definitions, we can look at uh, the complexity of equivalence. And I'm going to give a brief reminder because as you may have noticed uh, when I gave you the contributions, we are going inside non-classical uh, complexity classes. So let's start with basics. Uh, SAT, you give me a Boolean formula and uh, I should tell you if phi can become true for some valuation. Does there exist a valuation such that phi is true? And this is the classical problem used to define uh, NP problems. You consider a, a non-deterministic Turing machine and uh, a problem is inside this class if there exists a Turing machine uh, that recognizes exactly all the elements of the language and for each element of the language the Turing machine will have at least one accepting path and for that uh, the idea is that you have at least one valuation uh, that satisfies the formula. You can see it in terms of probabilities, uh, the Turing machine accepts with non-zero probability when you give it the uh, formula as input. Uh, we can then consider from SAT multiple variations of this problem and obtain new uh, complexity classes uh, that uh, such that half SAT is complete for this uh, complexity classes, for instance. Half SAT is well named because we just expect that true should be that phi should be true for exactly half of its valuations. Uh, this is called the exact counting uh, complexity class uh, C equal P. Uh, half of the paces of a Turing machine should be accepting ones. So you can compare with NP where we asked that at least one path uh, was accepting. And in terms of, prob of probabilities, uh, the Turing machine should accept with probability one half. And essentially, you can start to see the links with our problems because if you see phi as a Boolean formula, if you consider that you sample at random the values of the variables inside phi, phi, sorry, uh, then it turns out that um, the formula will be true with probability one half if and only if it is in half that. So you start to see the link between probabilities, equivalence between programs, and this kind of class uh, of complexity classes. Uh, the thing is that um, we need to go higher inside the complexity classes. Uh, we need to consider uh, formulas depending on two sets of variables. And for any possible valuation of one of the set of the vari variable, phi should be true for exactly half of the valuation of the other set of variables. Uh, this is the problem which is complete for co-NP with an oracle that solves problems inside C equal P. And 
this is essentially the, the definition. Uh, what we want to be able to do uh, for this uh, complex class is show uh, that all problem equivalence is complete. And first question, the earnest, can we solve a half set using equivalence? Actually, I already told you that we can. Uh, because as I said, the formula phi is going to be equivalent to R. Recall that R is simply the program that is equal to zero with probability one half and to one with probability one half. Uh, and phi should be equivalent to this if and if, if it is in half sat. The idea is that we see uh, x as random variables, y as input variables, and then you see the half sat appearing because for all possible values of the input variables, there exists exactly half of the valuations of x so that r, uh, so that phi is equivalent to r. Basic. Equiv, in the case of f2, is coin p with oracle c equal p r. Uh, for the membership, it's not uh, overly complicated. We start, uh, we can describe a Turing machine parameterized by p and q two, pro two programs, uh, c some possible output value of the two programs, and i a sequence of inputs for the two programs. Uh, then what we do is that we sample some x uh, in 0 and 1. And then what we do is that uh, with probability 1 half, we accept if p is equal to c, and with probability 1 half, we accept if q is equal to c. Why is Turing machine interesting? Essentially, it accepts uh, with uh, this probability, which is with probability one half x equals zero, uh, we, we accept with the probability that p is equal to c, and with one half of the probability, we accept if q is equal to c. That's not exactly what we want, uh, but what we want, we can easily obtain it by replacing uh, just this q equals c by q distinct from c, because then. Uh, this small part of the equation, it changes. It becomes one minus q, one minus the previous probability. And now, the probability that p, that uh, the Turing machine accepts is exactly one half plus probability that p equals c minus probability that q equals c. So in fact, our Turing machine accepts with probability one half if and only if the probability that p is equal to c is equal to the probability that q is equal to c. And that's uh, the basic uh, building block. If we can do it for all possible c, for all possible output value, we can check if the two programs are equivalent. And this is typically what we can do using co-np complexity by simply uh, going over all possible inputs and all possible output value and checking the C equal P problem. So that's it for the completeness. And let's go to the more interesting contribution, universal equivalence. So we're going to look at the base case. We will only have programs without conditionals. And in fact, those programs are essentially tuples of polynomials. We are also consider that we don't have inputs because Recall that I said previously that uh, equivalence is equivalent, is inter-reducible to equivalence for programs without inputs. Um, so I won't show the reduction, but we don't have to consider inputs. So the, mathemati the mathematical formulation of the problem for this kind of uh, polynomials can be written in this way. We simply ask, that for all possible output values and for all k, the number of random valuations, the number of valuations of the random variables inside f q to the power of k, so that's the link between the k and the k, it's here. So the number of random valuations such that p equals c is equal to the number of valuations such that q equals c. We simply went from uh, probabilities to counting the number of points, which is exactly the same thing. So why is this nice? Because uh, mathematicians are quite good at what they do. And notably, they defined uh, this uh, mathematical object, the local zeta function. 
So given a polynomial p, uh, we can express some quantity over it, uh, which is the exponential of the sum of something quite interesting, this small uh, nk of p. And you're quickly going to understand why. nk of p is defined as the number of r such that pr equals 0. So we can see the link with the previous uh, writing of equivalence. And in fact, this sum, because it goes over all possible cases, exactly captures uh, this NKP for all possible k. It contains all the information about all those NKP. So the main idea is simply this big observation. Two polynomials have the same local zeta function if and only if the, say, the number of r such that pr equals 0 is equal to the number of r such that q of r equals 0. And actually, thanks to the mathematicians, we can compute z of p and z of q. And thus, we can check this. What does it mean to check this? It means that we can decide, given two programs, if they are equal to 0 with the same probability over all extensions of a finite field. And from this, uh, we do a bit of uh, encoding. I won't describe it here. But uh, by computing three well-chosen local data functions, we can actually check the equality not just on 0 of the distributions, but we can check the equality of the distributions over all possible values. And thus, we can decide universal equivalence. So one of the questions is how to handle conditionals. Because well, what we can classically do in finite fields is encode conditional branchings. Uh, because for a fixed finite field q to the power of k, we can write these kind of things. We can say that if b is not equal to 0, then p l q, it's actually completely equivalent to this arithmetic expression. Why is that? Because b to the power of q power k minus 1, it's uh, simply an expression, thanks to the rules of the finite fields, which is equal to 0 if b equals 0, and 1 if b is not equal to 0. And this, when b equals 0, you simply get q. When b is equal to 1, you get q plus q minus q, you get p. So the thing is, it depends on k. So we cannot use this to remove the conditionals inside our uh, problem for universal equivalence. So I'm going to use this uh, reduction because I find it uh, quite funny. Uh, there is actually a nice solution to this problem, which is that b as an inverse, if and only if b is not equal to 0. And then we can play a bit around and introduce a fresh variable uh, that will be meant to represent the inverse of b. And we can, in fact, encode uh, the fact that t, the fresh variable t is equal to this quantity over b, if and only if those two equations are satisfied. And we can count, recall that uh, this is what uh, the local zeta function is doing. It's counting the number of points so that something is equal to 0, in fact. Uh, and we can, uh, this something can be a tuple of polynomial. So uh, from q plus tb p minus q, which is meant to represent the if b not equal to 0, then p else q. Uh, from this expression, we had two equations. And those equations ensure that all the valuations that we consider here are such that t is equal to b to the power of q power k minus 2. And then t times b is equal to what we wanted on the previous slide, b to the power of q power k minus 1. And this, this indeed does follow the uh, distribution of if b not equal to 0, then p l q. So we did remove the dependencies 
the, de the, the dependency on the k and we can use this inside nk and inside the local zeta function. So to conclude, universal equivalence is decidable and because it's equivalent to independence, both of those problems are decidable. Independence and equivalence are coin p with oracle c equal p complete, which is uh, considered to be non-tractable, sadly. And I didn't talk about it at all, but for the majority problem, uh, it's coin p to the power of pp, where pp is equivalent of c equal p, where we ask uh, that the probability of the Turing machine to accept is greater than one, uh, than half, rather than uh, exactly half. And uh, we are able to obtain a reduction to a widely studied problem, notably at least, which is uh, the positivity problem. Uh, it asks, given a linear recurrent sequence, so that's uh, essentially a sequence of integers defined by your recurrence relation, uh, it asks if uh, all the terms of the sequence, of the linear sequence, are positive. If positivity is decidable, then majority uh, will be decidable, well, universal majority will be decidable. And actually, I, uh, I have given you a small subset of uh, what we do because our uh, probabilistic program inside the paper actually supports the observed primitive which is one of the classical constructs of uh, probabilistic programs. And you can also sample variables inside uh, not just the whole field, but any set which is defined by your condition of our polynomial. Not uh, that uh, you can only perform uniform samplings over such sets. So if you want more complex distributions, you need to build them by combining multiple variables. And of course, conditionals. As I said, if you add loops to our programs, uh, universal equivalence becomes undecidable. So we don't really know how to extend the probabilistic language. One of the big qu open questions for our work, um, it's a bit frustrating. Uh, we were not able to prove that the universal question is strictly harder than the non-universal one. Uh, we don't have a better lower complexity bound for the universal equivalence than just the lower co the complexity bound of equivalence. So it's a bit frustrating because intuitively we want to believe that universal equivalence is really harder, but for the moment we haven't been able to prove it. So open uh, question. And of course, is positivity decidable? Then we will get the decidability of our majority question. And finally, it might be interesting to look at uh, other probabilistic properties. Some of them are linked to security, for instance, uh, simulability questions. Thank you for your attention, and bye.